More than just a department store, the outlet was both a legend and a landmark in Rhode Island. We'll take a look back at its fascinating history. Hello, I'm Larry Estepa. Welcome to NBC 10 Timelines. In today's world of mega malls and shopping on the web, it's hard to remember that a customer-friendly department store like the outlet once existed. Join us now as we take a walk down memory lane and find out what made this Providence institution such a unique part of our history. The term department store first came into use in the late 1800s. By the turn of the century, when this silent movie was made, everybody knew the meaning of a bargain. The humble origin of Rhode Island's most famous department store can be found in Providence City Hall archives. In 1894, an ambitious young man paid $5 for a peddler's license. Over the years, that investment would be transformed into millions. Joseph Samuels and his brother Leon opened a store called the Manufacturer's Outlet Company. They offered goods direct from the factory at a big discount. The idea offended the established local merchants. The Providence Journal refused to carry any advertisements for the outlet. But the Samuel brothers were not intimidated. They started their own newspaper, the Outlet Bulletin, and hit upon a popular issue, free trolley car transfers. It was an attractive idea with most shoppers, and it had a built-in bonus. The Samuels knew that people could use their transfers to get from downtown to the outlet on Waybosset Street. The brothers fought hard in the cutthroat business of retail sales through the turn of the century and into the early 1900s. When the store celebrated 25 years in business, even its competitors had to admit that the outlet was here to stay. Joseph Samuels had become wealthy and prosperous. The Colonel, as he was known, still took a close interest in the daily operation of the outlet. He came in the store mornings, oh, quarter past, half past eight, store opened at 9.30. And he'd walk through and look at all the merchandise. And he got after me once for not using the elevator. I was halfway up the second floor back stairs on Garnett Street. And he pulled me by the arm and he said, do you work here? And I said, yes. And he says, I don't want you walking these stairs. He says, we have elevators for even our employees. So I used the elevator after that. I talked with one girl and they used to have, uh, <clears throat> one of the organizations, they used to have a, uh, a dance in, in the in the ballroom here in the, and he danced with all the girls. You know, a good dancer, she said. <laughs> if you had a rag around your throat, you'd say, Ed, find out about that kid. See where he lives. <laughs> find out if you can find anything about the family, how destitute the family might be. Well, that kid, if there was something wrong with that kid, he'd have him sent to the doctor to take care of it. Joseph Samuels and his wife were a happy couple, but with just one daughter, the colonel faced a dilemma. In those days, the idea of leaving your company to a woman was unthinkable. It was good news when a grandson, Joseph Samuel Sinclair, was born. Doty, as he was nicknamed, would eventually run the outlet company. In 1922, WJAR Radio went on the air, broadcasting from a station right in the store. Not only could the outlet advertise on the airways, it could also sell radio sets to its customers. The Samuel brothers knew how to generate publicity. While visiting Providence, Harry Houdini escaped from an outlet crate. A brave couple got married on the top of an arch erected by the store to celebrate Old Home Week. In 1927, the first transatlantic phone call from Rhode Island to London was made by Colonel Samuels. The outlet was also known for its generosity. In the winter, tons of coal were given to poor families. In the summer, the store provided holiday trips for orphans. Free eye exams and glasses were made available to those who couldn't afford them. The Colonel even paid for the construction and operation of a children's dental clinic. In today's world of heartless, greedy corporations run by money-hungry CEOs, it's difficult to believe that there were once men like Joseph Samuels. When he died at the age of 74, those he had helped and those who had worked for him were devastated. When he died, all the girls, sales girls and everybody, damn near died with him. and they, they missed him something terrible. Soon after the colonel died, World War II erupted, 
transforming every American business, including department stores. Now, just what is our work in this war? You and I are retail salespeople. There are five million of us in the United States. That is an army if we pull together, a mob that deserves no victory if we don't. Every time America puts its hand in its pants pocket or goes on a treasure hunt in a woman's purse, it's because you and I have sold them something. And now Uncle Sam needs our training. He's handed us the biggest selling job in history. Now is our chance to show every dictator that selling is a greater force than the whip of oppression. War bonds and stamps. The outlet did its patriotic duty by selling war bonds and survived the difficult economic times that accompanied the war. The rules that govern a department store often reflect the values held by the country itself. To understand a nation, just look at the relation between merchant and customer. Employees who come in contact with customers are expected to maintain a neat, business-like appearance and conform to required dress regulations. These regulations are described completely in the outlet company's store manual and will be discussed further with you in training class. The paternal tone of the store's training film seems quaint to us today and essentially harmless, but in the early days of retailing, there were unwritten rules that were not so charming. In 1940, there were over 100,000 women employed in sales at department stores throughout the country, yet less than one half of 1% were black. The National Urban League began a campaign to get jobs for African Americans in department stores, not in the menial tasks they were usually assigned to, but as salespeople. No local department store would accept the challenge until December 1947. I had gone to every department store downtown to apply for a job as a sales clerk, and everyone gave me the brush, as usual. And Mrs. Wiley came by. She says, Louise, we've been trying to call you all morning. Shirley wants you to go over to the outlet. They are going to, they are hiring colored sales girls. So I, she said, would you like to work? I said, sure. Outlet broke the ice. They broke the color line with black salespeople, yes. Perhaps the best way to understand what was so special about the outlet is by listening to those who once worked there. It was like we were like one big family. You, you didn't mind going to work. I enjoyed going to work. I looked forward. I went, I went inside half an hour now before I had to start. I enjoyed it. And the important thing about the outlet, if you showed any ambition, and if you were aggressive, you were moved along. So there was uh, some competition there. They knew they would be promoted. We had families uh, coming. Everybody got their first communion suit and, and confirmation suit here. Uh, we had a policy if, for example, if unfortunately someone had a death in the family, we would bring in a tailor, and they could come in at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. We'd outfit the whole family you know, in black at the time. Uh, we do things like this without any question. Men's pants, I specialize in men's pants. And when the salesman sold a suit and it was too tight, one of the salesmen would come upstairs and say, let it out. So right away, Mr. Gatsby would give me the pants and I'll let out the pants and the salesman would come, try it on the customer and it would fit. That's how he made a sale. Yeah, I did a little bit of, uh, of store security. They uh, had me at Christmas time keep my, my school clothes on when I came in, my coat, and walk around and look for shoplifters. Uh, I probably learned a little bit of my cynicism uh, that, over the years from that. We did a lot of other things. We were thinking of changing the name. They came up with a name, which, I, as I recall, was the, the Outlook. and. Uh, the fee for that company was huge. It was in, I don't know, fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. We had had a contest in the company maybe about a year earlier than that to come up with a name of our publication, our house organ, and my secretary had wanted the name that she had come up with was Outlook, and she got two dollars for that. So she said, "You owe me uh, fourteen thousand nine hundred ninety-eight dollars." I think the Outlook was lucky to have a medical person, not because it was me but to get the attention and get to the hospital or doctor or anything, you know, I think that was very important and I think it was good for 
the business also that this person is taking care of. I mean, you got, we had a couple suicides in, in the outlet. We had uh, a couple amputations and, you know, you'd never think that these things happen in a place of industry, but it does. I remember uh, uh, when I met one of the older gentlemen in the store and uh, uh, he wanted to know what I did and so forth. And I said, I was in the broadcast division. And, oh, he said, you're on the fourth floor. I said, no, 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 I'm the television station on the fifth floor. Oh, he said, you're the wireless people. So uh, there was still that impression that we were the wireless people. But all good things must come to an end. Facing increasing pressure from malls and other discount retailers, the board of directors decided to sell the outlet in 1979. A company called United Department Stores bought the business, but declared bankruptcy just two years later. A host of proposals, promises, and plans were made to transform the building into something special, but in the fall of 1986, those ideas went up in smoke. All companies responding on box 1415, we have a report of a possible fire on the top of the outlet building, the old outlet building. The charred remains of the once proud department store were torn down and eventually replaced by a college campus. But the Samuel brothers' dream lives on. The outlet gave birth to a television station that began broadcasting in 1949. Over half a century later, WJAR-TV is still going strong. Like the outlet department store, many of the people you've just seen are no longer with us. We'd like to dedicate this episode to their memory.